El Evangelio según Lucas, capítulo 18. Jesus spoke this parable addressed to those who believed in their own self-righteousness while holding everyone else in contempt. Two people went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed like this. I give you thanks, O God, that I'm not like others, greedy, crooked, adulterous, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes on everything I earn. The other one, however, kept a distance, not even daring to look up to heaven. In real humility, all the tax collector said was, O oh God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Believe me, the tax collector went home from the temple right with God, while the Pharisee didn't. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, while those who humble themselves will be exalted. La palabra de Dios. You may be seated. When I preached last, I noted the, uh, the didactic nature of Jesus throughout Luke, teaching over and over again, lifting up culturally accepted norms and flipping them on their heads. And we're again rewarded today with the, the point of the scripture laid squarely before us in the first sentence today. It says, he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. We're in a streak of parables about prayer in Luke. The first part of Luke 18 talking about persistence in prayer while poking fun at the fickle nature of human judicial systems. And today, another group of disciples needs to hear a different kind of encouraging message about prayer. As easy as it was for some disciples to get discouraged with the rumors, the arguing, and the threats against their lives, it may have been just as easy for another group to be filled up with pride for their new way of encountering God. If Jesus is the Messiah, after all, then how great we must be that he has chosen us to hang out with. These may have been the same disciples who argued about who got to sit at the right hand, and who wondered so passionately and defensively who would betray or deny Jesus, when in fact it would be all of them. The disciples needed to hear that God hears all their prayers, but they also needed to hear that our prayers should come without pretense, that we are responsible for laying all of ourselves before God. And in so doing, we'll be so much more known so much more capable of love. So let me acknowledge some things that I found to be interesting about this story. So that the two men in the story couldn't be any more different from one another. It's interesting to me that a Pharisee is the one mentioned here. It's not unique because the Pharisees are often described as a rival group, ministry of Jesus and John the Baptist. But clearly, Pharisees have the power, so Jesus is kind of punching up here. There are two explanations as to why the Pharisee is mentioned that I, that I hadn't seen. Some suggest that Jesus himself may have been a Pharisee, just as Paul is thought to have been a Pharisee, and that through Jesus' constant in inclusion of the Pharisees as the insider group, he is acknowledging the deconstruction of even those norms that he himself was raised and taught in. Another explanation of why the Pharisees are picked on so much is that at the time of this gospel's writing, around 70 AD or so, members of the newer Jewish tradition, the Jewish Christians that Luke included, were battling with the older Jewish tradition, the Pharisees, for control. So Luke is really highlighting that, that battle for power. So whatever the case may be, the story we have before us offers a critical contrast in the ways of being God. 
the Pharisee whose traditions, tradition is presented in the Gospels as being overly concerned with appearances and rule following and getting it all just right, puts on the good show, the outward good show, pious prayer. But inwardly, we are told by Jesus that he is constantly comparing his life to the perceived lives of the tax collector and other quote unquote sinners. Sinners not like him. In prayer to God, he praises himself. The Pharisee looked great on the outside. He observed all the right rules, dressed correctly, publicly prayed like it was going out of style. But inside, he was not allowing himself the joy of being known. And he is drowning in other people's opinions of him. The tax collector was everybody's enemy, number one. He not only took the tax money, but he made sure that he got plenty of a good cut himself. But on the inside, he was experiencing being made known for who he really was, not just his job or what other people saw of him accepting himself and naming his faults and perhaps committing himself to a different way of being. Notice that the Pharisee in the story prayed first to be thankful for who he was not. This is the striking difference between the two prayers. The first says, thank God I'm not like these people. And the second says, God, it's a miracle that you would accept even me. The first says, here's what makes me so great. Here's what makes my beliefs so great. The other says, here's what I've taken this life for granted. And the end result is that the Pharisee experiences a synthetic self and the tax collector experiences the joy. Perhaps it doesn't feel joyful at the moment, but the real true joy of accepting that one is really and truly fully known by God and loved in spite of whatever our past may look like. One of the first stories that we ever learn about our faith is the story of Adam and Eve in Genesis. Their story tells us that the first human creatures on the earth lived a life of bliss and complete harmony with God and creation. There is no shame or guilt because, as the story goes, there is nothing yet to be ashamed of or feel guilty about. Life consisted of a naked romp through a lush garden until they did something that they were told not to do. And because of this, the equation for fun romps through the garden didn't add up anymore. We did this one thing we weren't supposed to do, and what else is there? So they covered themselves up in shame and guilt and hid from God what God knew all along. In this time of hiding, Adam and Eve were exhibiting an inauthentic relationship, not just with God, but with themselves, and experienced a lack of integrity and a lack wholeness in themselves, experienced shame and guilt for the first time as the story goes. Really, I believe that's an allegory for our own life, right? It's an individual story about us, about how humans come to discover themselves. So this is what an inauthentic or incomplete prayer life can do to us, can cause shame, guilt, hiding, or even running away. But when we pray completely as ourselves or in a covenant groups or a small groups where it's safe and confidential, we are called to bring out all of ourselves, not just before God, but before our people, people that love us and know us. No need for shame, no need for guilt, no need for covering up, no need for hiding. 
It's not just about releasing the baggage, but it's about creating an opening for the love of ourselves to be fully present to ourselves. So think about this, the, the person that knows you the best on this earth. Think about that person, have that person in your mind, the person who knows you the best. They know your heart. They know your hopes, your dreams, your fears, and many of the things that you may not be proud of. Chances are this person loves you and you love that person more than you love anyone else. It's because you have made yourself known to that person and have made room for that love between you to flourish. And there's th some for whom this is not a reality. For everything exists on a giant poker table in order to survive to the end of the round called life. Cards have to be held as close to our chest, hidden from everyone, just to survive. There's no room to be made known because the world and absolutely everyone in it is not to be trusted. It's not a wrong way to live. It's just the way it is. Traumas, disappointments, grief, abuse, loss, all contribute to feelings of distrust. But being closely guarded from those who love us means that there's no room or very little room for love, therefore joy to flourish and thrive. Perhaps we can look at the Pharisee with compassion who is outwardly projecting because he was so scared of being made known. looking at those two ways of being known and of hiding forever and how they relate to the text, I think we know which way that Jesus calls us to, to, to live. But how often do we choose that way with our relationship with God, let alone other people? God wants to be fully known to us and desires that same way of being with all of God's children. How tight-fisted and how tight-lipped can we be in our divine walk? We sometimes think to ourselves, God has better things to do than to listen to me. Or like the Pharisee in the story, we don't ever bring up the cold, hard facts about ourselves with God. It's always about what is wrong with others, or we feel shamed because what we want to bring up to God is so wrong that we can't possibly bring it up. So we hide our poker hand from even God by not praying, or by hiding behind a facade of prayer that just isn't us. I had a friend who struggled with online gambling and we held each other accountable in our lives. And believe me, he knows me very well. And one night, which would have been really late for him because he's on the East Coast, I got an email from him saying, God, give me the strength. My wife and kids are away for the night, and I'm all by myself. The temptation to gamble is so strong. God, give me the strength. That perceived sense of isolation is what had swallowed him up into the addiction in the first place. And when he felt no one was looking or that no one would care or that his behavior had no impact on anyone around him, the gambling began and would continue to eat up their savings. But now it was different. In the email prayer that he sent to me, he was acknowledging that he was not alone. And because of our relationship, he knew that I knew him, that he knew me. So just by writing that prayer to God and including me in it, 
He knew that God, along with someone who cares deeply for him and his family, was going to encourage him to struggle because he submitted all of himself in that moment. He was able to find the courage to go to sleep in peace. I imagine that through vulnerability and transparency, we all can be filled up with that courage. But we have to, but have we even acknowledged to ourselves in the first place that something is getting in the way, that ability to be whole? You may be familiar with the story of the shooting in the Amish schoolhouse in 2006. Two things happened in that incident that were tragic beyond belief and also hopeful beyond belief. The unnecessary death due to our country's obsession with weaponry is tragedy number one. But what was found in the suicide note left by the man who did it it was a 33-year-old dishwasher, father of three, is tragedy number two. His wife had no clue that anything was wrong. In fact, just that morning, they had walked their own child to the bus stop together. He said in the note that he was experiencing terrible guilt and shame over an event of abuse he said he inflicted when he was 12 years old and was having temptations to reoffend. This is why he said he had did what he did. The story of complete isolation of that part of himself from every part of his world and the God who would have loved to have a relationship with him is the tragic story of not being known to anyone. How can we welcome all the parts of ourselves, even those that bring us deep shame and sadness to the table that is us. So that the hidden and unmet needs we have for healing and wholeness don't manifest themselves in outwardly hurtful and tragic ways. But as I said, the story also contains hope because the families and other Amish community members were obviously immensely affected by this horrific and unimaginable event. And there was extreme grief, anger, cries out for God's justice and resentment that anyone would feel as a result of something like this. And they came together and they prayed like they'd never prayed before. And I imagine the prayers reflected exactly what they were feeling toward the world toward God, toward the murderer. But in the midst of their grief, those families were vulnerable before God and before one another and prayed not to scheme how to take revenge or retaliation on the shooter's family, but so that they could eventually make space for their own future and embrace the man's family. Because they recognized in his family the hurt and the pain that they were also feeling losing a family member. And embrace them in a circle of God's healing, love, and peace. In the midst of tears and weeping, that's exactly what happened to the stunned disbelief of many who watched the story unfold. Many people struggled to reconcile forgiveness and justice in this scenario. It doesn't make sense but their prayers did not erase the wrongs that had been done and forgiveness does not condone those actions or try to sweep them under the rug. Truly, there is no such thing as forgive and forget because you can never forget something like that. But the families were emptying themselves of retaliation and clinging on to anger and committed instead to giving the next moment a chance in spite of what's happened in the past. Just like the tax collector and those bold Amish prayer warriors, our lives can be emptied of anger, resentment, guilt, and shame. If we first make the bold decision to ask God and ask our fellow sojourners to walk with us, 
and carry us when it seems we cannot move forward on our own. Prayer isn't a show, but this isn't a lesson on how to pray right. It's not an ironic lesson that tells us to be thankful for not being the Pharisee. You find yourself doing that in your head? I, I did. Oh, at least I'm not like that Pharisee praying. It's exactly what the Pharisee is doing in the story. It's a lesson that tells us to just be us. No show needed. No veneer needed. Let ourselves enter into that holiest of holy places with God, all of ourselves into that place. There's a book that I read a long time ago called The Me I Want to Be. And the author is a guy named John Ortberg. I think some of you might know him. He's typically not an author that, that I would read uh, very often, but this book grabbed me. And he describes our lives like this, like the ancient Jewish temples, like in the, in the parable. The temples were built with three courts. There were the outer courts. These are the places that were very public, right? Anyone could go there, vendors, priests, officials, homeless people, animals, whatever. Anyone could go there. This is the you, this is the me, that everyone encounters, the one that answers the question, how are things going? Like I asked with the kids, how are things going? And we answer that question, fine, good. And we walk away. No matter how we really feel, it's our public facade. Then there are the inner courts, which not everyone has access to. Only a few people were allowed, the priests and others with similar credentials. For us, this is a place where our spouse or our family members or very close friends can reside, people who know you very well, our church family. And then there's the Holy of the Holies. And this was a space in the temple that was where only the chief priest could go. In fact, it was said that there was only enough room in that space for that person and God. And we have that too. That is the place in our soul which only God is familiar. entering into that space with God where we can both access the best of ourselves and acknowledge parts of ourselves that we're not very proud of, the sum of which God loves dearly. We can make space for the beautiful and full of life God, or full of love life that God has called us to. So in Levin here, may we continue to create a space and a community that values our public and our relational selves, those outer two courts that I think we do really well, right? Very publicly facing community, very relational community. And also make space for developing that vulnerable and intimate relationship the divine, so that on that level, there are no facades. There's nothing hidden. So with that, I just invite you to pray with me as we open ourselves and open our souls up individually and collectively. God, thank you for this time. Thank you for offering this space where we can be known, where the children in our lives can come and sit on a quilt and share practices that reveal how they are made known in their home life. And where our hope is, is that they can find that place here as well. 
and that we're creating that space for all people, no matter what their age is. We're creating a space of being known. All the things that can drive us from you, and also the things that can be helpful in us being drawn to you. So God, thank you for all the people in this room who know me, all the people in this room who know each other. Help us collectively to want to know you better. Call upon you our times of grief, and our times of utmost joy. All this we ask in your name. Amen.